Hello, my name is Jessica Ramsey. I am the NIOSH Musculoskeletal Health Program Coordinator. We'd like to thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, this webinar is co-sponsored by the NIOSH Musculoskeletal Health um, Program, as well as the Center for Occupational Robotics Research. And we would like to thank uh, Don Castillo and Hong Wei Xiao for helping us distribute the announcement for today's webinar. Okay, so now to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Connor Walsh is a professor at the John A. Paulson Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and an associate faculty member at the Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. He is the founder of the Harvard Biodesign Lab, which brings together resources from the engineering, industrial design, apparel, clinical, and business communities to develop new robotic technologies for augmenting and restoring human performance. We're excited today to have Dr. Walsh speak to us about lightweight and non-restrictive exosuits for the clinic, community, and workplace. And I will turn everything over to Connor. Thanks so much, uh, Jessica, for the introduction and, and also Jack and the NIOSH team for the invitation to present today. It's really nice to be able to present to this audience and I'm looking forward to hearing questions from, from people as well. So hopefully you can see my screen now um, and just, you know, just uh, let someone know if there's any issue at any time and happy to adjust things if we need to do that. Um, so I'm going to talk today about, you know, uh, you know, some of our work in particular that we've been kind of doing more recently, looking at devices to assist people in, in occupational settings. And I'll also talk a little bit about kind of where we've come from with our work to date, um, and also kind of where we see some of the challenges going forward in the future. So our, our research group focuses a lot on applying disruptive soft robotic technologies to different application areas. And we're very translation focused. So we've been working on devices for restoring function um, after people have had some type of, of um, injury, such as neurologic injury, and helping people recover quicker after they've had you know, injury or, or muscle injuries or other soft tissue injuries and helping people prevent injuries from happening in the first place, which is where I'll focus most of the time um, today on. And overall, we're just very excited and passionate and interested in how we augment human ability and make people be able to do more than they normally would be able to on their own. And so our, our research group, you know, we've deliberately tried to have it be very multidisciplinary. And um, so you can kind of see on this slide an overview of the different types of expertise that we have, you know, in our lab and then on the team. And so, you know, you know, for, you know, the robotics aspect is, you know, mechanical engineering design, embedded systems, and sensor development, control algorithms, signal processing, and, you know, that's all kind of lumped in the robotics category. And then early on, we also realized the importance of functional apparel design, and, you know, to create these wearable systems and really make systems that are truly lightweight, non-restrictive, and, you know, and wearable for long periods of time. The other thing that we've you know, done a lot of as well is really trying to think about the user experience. And so early on you know, in these research projects, we think a little bit about the product vision. We think a little bit about what would be a minimal viable prototype that we might wanna create. Um, and we do surveys and we do focus groups to try and collect information from stakeholders to make sure that the research that we're doing can eventually lead to something that will have value and help people. Um, and then the other type of expertise that I know a lot of people on this call have is, you know, we, we have a pretty big effort in doing this um, biomechanical and physiological studies to kind of both kind of run formal studies to kind of quantify the impact of our kind of more refined technologies. But we also use this to guide the, guide the development as well. So, we, you know, we're doing testing every week, um, at least in normal times, um, to be able to kind of learn about kind of a component or a new control algorithm or you know, in a new soup component to, to see how they work and if we can learn anything from that testing that can guide the ongoing design and development. And then we're also very passionate about technology translation. And so, you know, we're interested in partnering with industry or spinning out companies, depending on, on what makes sense for the team and for the technology. And so today, what I'm gonna focus mostly on is kind of our work, kind of trying to create lightweight and active systems um, either for the back and also for the shoulder that can help you when you need it and then get out of the way at all other times. And, and that's been one of the key features of our, our work over the last you know, 10 years or so is kind of developing kind of wearable robots that may not be able to apply as high levels of assistance as you would get from a more traditional you know, um, exoskeleton technology, but devices that can you know, apply 
30%, you know, you know, or thereabouts, um, you know, to specific parts of the body, and then be very lightweight and non-restrictive and allow people to move in a very natural and free way. So I'll, I'll get into these two technologies um, a little bit in the webinar today as well. Um, so this is where we started. I thought it would be fun to kind of also show, you know, this. Um, so, you know, we, we, this is from 2012 or 2013, some of our first prototypes for kind of both our exosuit. At that time, we were looking at a pneumatic system um, and also our self-robotic glove that you can see is indestructible um, here in this video. And, but this is kind of where we started for these technologies, you know, very much kind of crude prototypes, a uh, proof of concept. And the key idea here was that, can we kind of integrate actuation um, into apparel and have it apply forces in a way that can be useful? That was really kind of the first question that we were asking when we started this research. And, and since then, you know, we've been kind of refining these technologies and looking at different applications of these technologies, you know, um, since, since that time as well. And I think the other thing I would just point out is that, you know, these, these technology development efforts, they take time, they take iteration, they take partnerships. And, um, you know, it's, it's not something that happens overnight and it also requires a, a big team. So there's a lot of people who have contributed to these projects over, over the years. I mean, I think our key expertise can be summed up in, in these three different areas here. So it's really kind of using an understanding of movement science to think about, you know, what, you know, is the best way to help the body move or, you know, and help it, you know, not get strained. Um, and then think about combining robotics and apparel design to create kind of these, you know, kind of new types of wearable systems um, that can kind of give this kind of on-demand assistance and, and then get out of the way and when you don't want it to be, you know, helping you or, or applying forces to you. And this video here, this time-lapse also kind of just shows an idea of what our, our lab environment looks like. We actually just moved labs, um, but this is our old lab, but basically kind of apparel designers working alongside movement scientists, working alongside engineers, um, who are kind of like evaluating systems, testing systems quickly, looking at signals from sensors, um, evaluating metabolic cost. And then eventually, you know, after some time, it's usually like at least a year, I would say, in terms of the development cycle, we kind of finalize a system and then we build kind of multiple different prototypes. Um, and we, you know, really benefited from staff engineers working on our projects in addition to kind of the graduate students and postdocs that you would normally have at an academic um, lab. Um, because we, we need to create robust prototypes so we can actually run studies and actually understand how people interact with these machines. And if the prototype keeps breaking, you know, every, every 30 minutes, and because it was made by a graduate student, you know, I was also a graduate student one day or back in the day, um, then that's going to be challenging. So we, we, we really put a lot of effort in system development and, and prototype development too. And so the first kind of project that I'm going to talk about is, you know, our inflatables technology. So this is really quite simple. And, um, you know, in essence, we're kind of inflating textile based structures and um, to have them apply forces to the body. So we have some textile materials and then we want to either inflate them by inflating them directly or by having balloons inside them that can be inflated. And so this is illustrated very simply here where you can have this kind of fully fabric based kind of textile actuator. Um, and then there's two pockets inside and two different balloons. So when one balloon inflates, it can stiffen like a beam. And when the other balloon inflates, it can articulate like a finger. And so, you know, the way that we achieve this is by having kind of um, varied material properties, you know, um, along the kind of textile structure so that different parts, you know, um, strain differently than others. And um, that gives you that kind of different types of articulation and, and, and motion as well. And so we started off kind of, you know, like I showed at the, at the beginning, you know, working on a soft robotic glove. So this is, you know, it's been a project that's been going on for many years in the lab and many people have contributed. And we started off with silicon based actuators and then moved towards textile based systems kind of later on. And then you can kind of see kind of the evolution of these prototypes. And, and really we wanted to create something that could be worn like a garment, but still could help the hand be able to kind of open and close. Um, and so this is just a video on one of our volunteers who had a spinal cord injury. Um, you can see here that he doesn't have any grip strength. Um, and I'm just showing this video because I think it shows that, you know, these devices can apply some force in synergy with what the person's, you know, underlying muscles are trying to do. And um, that then enables him to do something else that, you know, he wouldn't normally be able to do. And that's a little bit different than the occupational use cases, you know, where a person maybe is able to do the task, but we're just trying to take the strain off them so their muscles don't have to do the same amount of, of work. And so you can create all these different interesting you know, types of actuators. And there's been a number of other groups that have also been working in this area, but it's a very powerful approach to creating very simple systems that can exhibit complex behavior 
um, to help move a limb or, or move a joint um, you know, in, in the human body. Um, and so I'll spend a little bit of time today talking about work that we've been doing on the shoulder. So this is kind of just demonstrating on a mannequin. So you believe me that these actuators can actually lift an arm. Um, but you can see here that you can integrate kind of these actuators into a textile uh, structure that's harnessed to the body. And when they inflate, they're able to apply forces um, to help raise you know, um, a person's arm in, in this case. And so again, we, we first started on this area looking at medical applications. So this is an individual, another volunteer who had a spinal cord injury as well. And um, you can kind of see here that doesn't have sufficient um, proximal strength at the shoulder to be able to lift his arm um, and doesn't really have sufficient functionality for his hands to have good grip strength. But then using kind of a glove and shoulder system combined it is able to do something that he, he wouldn't normally be able to do. So I'll transition on now to kind of talk a little bit more about kind of the occupational kind of applications of these. And I, I thought before going on to kind of more industry or workplace, I'd mentioned something that we're also quite excited about and we think is important is, you know, physical therapists are, are working with patients and there's been a lot of, um, or occupational therapists, you know, a lot of development for the, the patient in terms of exoskeletons and devices. Um, but we also think that these tools can be beneficial for the, the therapist as, as well as the user. And um, so you can kind of see here in these videos, you know, a therapist trying to kind of help do these hand stretching exercises, you know, while the arm is elevated um, and having kind of pretty poor posture and, you know, finding it quite tiring because you're kind of having to work pretty hard um, versus if you're able to have one of these devices do some of the work where you can kind of inflate it, help it support the person's arm, the therapist can kind of really focus on what she, you know, in this case wants to do um, and not have to kind of worry about doing some of the, you know, the other things um, such as supporting the arm or kind of trying to, you know, be in, in a different kind of posture or position that might be awkward. And so this is kind of like, you know, we're, we're kind of motivated by this, you know, both for the, the patient side, but I, I also just wanted to mention, you know, for the therapist side, that these devices can really be kind of good ergonomic tools um, for, for them um, as kind of the, the stakeholder in, in this case. But I'll transition on a little bit and talk about, you know, the, the application that we see in for our shoulder system you know, would be kind of similar to kind of what many other kind of um, wearable robotic technologies or exoskeleton technologies um, have been focused on, which is overhead work. And, um, you know, and there's been many exciting devices developed. They've, they're getting more and more elegant all the time. Um, and these devices have definitely kind of, you know, started to get deployed in, in many different settings. And it's been very exciting to see kind of the increased adoption of this type of technology, um, you know, in, across the world, really. So, you know, for our approach, you know, we've been kind of trying to think about, could we create a device that could support the shoulder, you know, when your arms are overhead, um, but then deflate and get out of the way so you don't really notice that you're wearing it in the rest of the time. And so something that, you know, a lot of the existing devices are, are using passive assistance, where you have kind of some type of clever spring-based mechanism or, or other type of mechanism that can kind of help kind of provide support and keep the arms, you know, overhead. And, but we're trying to think about if you could do that with an active system and do it with an active system that could really then go transparent. So when the, the assistance is turned off and you, you don't feel like you're, you know, you're impeded to move and you know, if you wanted to do some other task other than overhead work. So this is kind of a concept illustration of, of that prototype. It's an inflatable pneumatic based system. And then you can see kind of the actuators integrated into the, the shirt system there as well. And so this is kind of really quite simple in, in theory, you know, we have these inflatable actuators and then, you know, the way we would like to see this working is that a person is just, you know, normally working, doing whatever tasks they are, but as soon as they put their hands overhead and the device would automatically detect that with some sensors and would trigger the inflation to happen and so that the person had support when they needed it. And so this is just being illustrated in this video here. You can see one of the research team members and, you know, as you raise your hands, it inflates automatically. And then it, it deflates, you know, so you're unrestricted. And then as soon as you raise your hand, it can detect that and then inflate, you know, fairly quickly and provide support to a person, you know, when they're working overhead as well. And so this has required a big effort from our team. We've been working on this for, you know, a couple of years in collaboration and with some industry partners and, and other faculty as well. And so, you know, a lot of the existing passive systems don't have sensors because they, they don't require sensors to activate them. So we've had to kind of think about which sensors should we integrate into these systems in order to have them, you know, be able to detect what a person is doing so that we can trigger the assistance to turn on and turn off. We have to understand the mechanics of these inflatable structures and think about what should be their material properties, what should be their geometry. 
and we have to think about you know how do we make that pneumatic supply unit um, you know as lightweight and as compact as quiet as possible so we've been thinking about optimizing you know that aspect of the system and then also how do we make this wearable so how do we integrate this into apparel and um, so that a person can easily wear this put it on and off and um, pretty quickly um, and actually enjoy wearing it so that they, they would want to wear it too and so on the sensing side, you know, we've been doing work with inertial measurement units where we put these kind of on a person's arm and torso and we try and understand and estimate kind of like what a person's arms are doing. So we're able to kind of understand um, kind of where their arms are relative to their, to their body. Um, and so we think that's basically kind of the that kinematics based approach can be an effective way to kind of be able to trigger the assistance to turn on and turn off when we need it. And um, we've recently kind of developed a controller. We have a paper coming out soon. Um, where we evaluated how well we could kind of detect kind of when a person you know would need assistance from the device and then trigger the assistance to turn on and so we got you know above 98 percent accuracy in terms of triggering when a person was working overhead but if they were doing something else at the waist level or picking something up from the floor it wouldn't kind of trigger during those times and um, so we're quite excited about you know the potential here is to kind of use a kinematic space approach and um, to estimate kind of what a person is doing and be able to trigger assistance from these inflatable structures in when a person is, is working overhead. Um, and it could also happen pretty quickly. And um, you know, we could do it kind of quickly enough that it, it really kind of the person didn't notice um, any delay. And um, this is just a short video demonstration kind of of that system. And um, so you can see it's fully portable and autonomous. And um, we're working on a next generation version at the moment. And um, so if you're kind of performing some type of task, kind of you know, that's not overhead work, you can do that. You can move your arms, you don't feel any resistance. And then as soon as you work overhead, um, you're able to have assistance from the device um, and apply support um, during those overhead activities. And then it deflates automatically and gets out of the way. Um, and then you're free to kind of, you know, quickly kind of perform other tasks without being impeded by the, by the device. Um, you know, we're very motivated to evaluate these devices. And so we've started building, you know, some simple, I would say, you know, I know other groups have done a lot of work in this area. Um, but we started pretty simple, which is kind of simple kind of overhead or kind of you know, shoulder height tasks and um, where we have people basically kind of drilling in bolts um, into this rig. We're able to kind of track kind of what they're doing. We use motion capture and then we also use EMG. We put EMG um, electrodes around the shoulder muscles to be able to understand the impact of the device assistance on compared to when they're not wearing the device at all. And so that's just what's shown here. I mean, this kind of uh, graph is some of the raw data. But basically kind of in, in blue, you can see no suit. So when they're performing it on their own and then in red is looking at muscle activity when they're wearing um, the device and it's providing support. And you can see that it reduces the um, EMG activity. And um, so we, these studies are still ongoing. It's still pretty early, but we did finish one kind of pilot um, where we looked at kind of, you know, in particular kind of the deltoid muscles and what the impact of the suit could be. And when it was just very much focused on standing and then, you know, working overhead, and, you know, we saw pretty, you know, big 40 to 50% reductions in some of the muscle activity um, of the deltoid muscles during that task when comparing no suit to wearing the suit. Um, and then kind of for, we also looked at kind of the effect on EMG activity as well, when a person was both working overhead, but then also doing some other tasks. Um, and we also saw some pretty nice large reductions um, during those activities as well. So, you know, we're obviously not doing a full field evaluation of this yet. Um, but that's something that we're very excited to partner with other people on. And um, so, you know, we're, we're doing all this in our, in our lab at the moment, but um, would love to kind of make connections with people on the webinar today. So please definitely just reach out to me if you have any interest in exploring collaborations around evaluating these devices. And um, as we make these prototypes more robust, our goal would be able to do that in both in the field and potentially in collaboration with other, other groups as well. Um, and then this is kind of, you know, where we're going with this technology. So like I said at the start, you know, people will need and want to be able to, you know, want to wear these devices for them to be successful. So we're really trying to think about kind of creating devices that can be, you know, worn like garments and, you know, put on quickly, taken off quickly, and adjusted quickly. And so this is kind of just a mock-up here, you know, of a prototype that we're, we're working on at the moment, where you can see that it's kind of something that we believe can be made, you know, lightweight enough and wearable enough that, you know, can be practical and, you know, for use kind of in, in kind of, uh, you know, industry or occupational settings pretty soon. So we're excited about that. 
So I'm going to transition a little bit on now to kind of the other technology. So this is kind of our soft exosuit technology that we've been working on for, um, you know, nine years or so at this stage, maybe a little bit more. Um, and so here, you know, really kind of it's, a, it's an uh, electro, um, it's a motor based approach. And, um, you know, so, you know, you know, here kind of the goal is um, apply forces with these cables um, in, in parallel with the biological muscles and to reduce the amount of work that the biological muscles would have to be doing. And so, you know, the challenge here has been creating kind of lightweight systems that can be comfortable to wear and that can be, you know, um, have low power so that we can kind of keep size, mass, form factor kind of pretty low. And we've basically been refining these technologies over the last number of years. And so I'll talk a little bit about where we started and then I'll, I'll talk about what we're doing now and when it comes to industrial applications. And so you can kind of see these cables kind of like pulling here and that's just basically kind of like, you know, driven by a motor and actuating that cable. And so we started this project, you know, this was really initiated in through some DARPA work that we did in early on. And the goal was to create kind of, you know, a multi-joint system that would be able to kind of reduce the metabolic cost of walking. And so this just a kind of a picture of that system shown here. Again, it's kind of following the idea of having systems be very lightweight and non-restrictive. So it's not any, adding any kinematic restrictions to the kind of lower limb joints. And um, it's also you know, very lightweight. So it doesn't add a lot of you know, um, added mass kind of to the individual. And so with this multi-joint system, we had a paper come out a few years ago, we were able to show that we you know, were just over 14 or almost 15% in reduction in energy cost of walking for carrying a load um, compared to you know, um, walking without the device um, at all. So that's shown in the graph at the bottom. And then we also wanted to think about how we might help more dynamic activities. Um, and so we had a, a nice paper come out, you know, about a year and a half ago um, that looked at, you know, um, a hip, so simplified version of that last device, a device that only assisted the hip joint that was able to help both walking and running um, in the lab and also outside. And so, you know, the, the, one of the nice features about this device was that it was actually able to automatically detect when a person was walking or running and be able to adapt the assistance dynamically to those different activities to be able to give them the best possible benefit and um, while they were moving or moving with this device. And so this was really the first time that we're starting to see, you know, these active devices be able to detect different types of activities um, and be able to apply um, the appropriate amount of assistance um, during those different times, during those different activities. Um, and the other area that we've looked at here with the soft exosuit is also, you know, the area of, of stroke and um, gait retraining, so rehabilitation after stroke. Um, and so I'll talk just a very little bit about that. So, you know, here we're trying to supplement a person's um, residual capacity. So after someone suffers a stroke, they may not be able to walk very well, but we, we would like to be able to get them walking better and get them walking more and um, to be able to have them have, you know, better, you know, therapy or better rehabilitation. Um, initially starting in a clinical setting. So the idea would be to you know, start using these devices early on in a clinic, but then be able to transition to using these devices in the community or in the home longer term. So we can really kind of help across the continuum of, of rehabilitation. And so this is one of our collaborators, Lou Wad, and we also worked with Terry Ellis um, at Boston University on, on this project as well. And so for this project, we licensed the technology to, to rewalk robotics. And um, so Rewalk, you know, is, you know, has a rigid exoskeleton and they are now commercializing the Restore soft exosuit and for in-clinic gait retraining and, you know, after a stroke. And it's been exciting to see the technology move from the lab um, and now being used in different clinics and entering this next phase of trying to kind of understand how to best fit it in um, to kind of the rehabilitation um, system. But I'll spend a little bit more time talking about, you know, our more recent work developing kind of soft exosuits for the back and um, to assist with lifting tasks. And um, so some of you might know Ignacio Galliana. And um, so he's now, he was in the lab. He's now CEO of Verve, which is a startup company that spun out of the lab. And um, so you can kind of see his email address I've listed here in case you have questions or want to get in touch with him about this. Um, and I think the website might have just launched recently too. So if you go to vervemotion.com and you can kind of learn a little bit more uh, as well. Um, so I don't think I need to spend a lot of time talking about the problems. People on this call are, are very familiar um, with them, but basically kind of the challenge is that even though there's a lot of robotics and automation um, moving into industry, there's still a lot of tasks that are performed manually and um, that you know, are causing kind of um, injuries that lead to kind of significant you know, um, health challenges for people and also economic challenges and for individuals and also for, for companies too. 
Um, and I think one of the key things here is that you know there's there's always going to be tasks that you know require a person um, to perform some type of physical activity, um, and they're going to be doing that task intermittently, so they're not going to be doing it all the time. So we want to have technologies that can help people when they're doing those tasks, and then not restrict them, you know, for the rest of the time. So kind of similar to the shoulder example that I talked about at the start. So this is just kind of an overview of kind of what the the Verve Safe Lift, um, you know, um, is is offering. You know, so the idea is be able to help people when they're lifting, and you know, um, or or reaching, and performing those tasks, um, and be able to kind of be transparent. So it kind of gets out of the way, and you don't notice that you're wearing it for you know the other time. So this idea of on-demand assistance, and um, through active sensing what a person is doing, and then dynamically adapting the assistance based on that person's movement. And the device can be you know quite lightweight, so it weighs just over four pounds. Um, and you know it has quite a long battery life. So I think there's been you know at least one worker who's worn it for a 12-hour shift and um, for a full day without changing the, the battery. Um, and then the other exciting thing about this technology is that you know we can leverage the sensors that are in the system to kind of collect data on how people are moving. And there's a lot of exciting kind of uh, development going on in that area um, at the moment with you know various kind of wearable sensor systems. Um, but here we can also kind of do something similar and also kind of use that data to better understand how people are moving or where there might be risky movements and, and use that to kind of optimize both the individual's kind of situation and, and potentially kind of also maybe the kind of a company's um, operations uh, as well. And so, so far Verve has been deploying these systems. It's still, you know, Verve's still in its early days, so it's still getting started. It launched um, in 2020 um, last year. And so Ignacio has been working hard to try and get it, get it going and get it off the ground. But there's been a very positive initial response. So a lot of people, you know, feel that, you know, they can really, you know, wear it. They don't really notice that they're wearing it. And we actually think that's a positive. You know, a lot of times you, you, you think about wearable robots and exoskeletons, you, you want to wear them and say, hey, I feel super strong. That's not really what we're going for. We, we prefer people to not really notice that they're wearing them. Um, but that it's able to kind of be helping them and taking kind of, you know, 30% or you know, thereabouts kind of of the strain off the person's um, soft tissue and back. Um, and I think the one thing that we do notice, and I think other groups might see this as well, is that if a person's using the device and then all of a sudden that, you know, they're no longer using it, they really notice that it's harder afterwards. And, um, you know, so the body is adapting to the assistance and allowing the person to still perform the task, but with, with less effort and less strain. Um, you know, I, I think people have also said that it helps them lift better with better form. We're interested in that. We haven't studied that yet as well. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear from some people that they feel like that they're lifting a little bit better um, when, when using the device as well. But really, we're not trying to change how people move. And um, it's just the way people seem to be adapting to kind of these devices um, as they wear them as well. And so one exciting thing that's ongoing, you know, at Harvard at the moment in, in this project is in addition to kind of maybe the, the field feedback that Verve is getting is we're, we're doing studies to really try and understand and quantify, you know, what is the impact of wearing these devices. And um, so we really understand the effect that they're having, you know, on, on the body and in particular, you know, on the back muscles and also on the hip muscles. So I'm not going to get into too much detail today. I'm happy to talk to people more about this. Um, and again, very open and interested in exploring collaborations with other groups. Um, but we ran a study recently where we looked at, you know, so in, in the in the label at the top, so NS means no suit, and then AS means active suit. So for the black and gray, for the no suit conditions, we had a person kind of perform squat lifting is what we're showing here, um, you know, with kind of 10 kilograms and also with six, kilo, six kilograms. So we tried to see kind of what is the difference between on peak EMG in, in looking at kind of lifting 10 kilograms versus lifting six kilograms. And then we also had the person, um, you know, have the active suit for those two conditions as well. And so the exciting thing was that, you know, we're basically kind of seeing, you know, in the active suit 10 kilogram conditions, you know, peak EMG values being similar to kind of the no suit six kilograms, essentially kind of showing that we're taking about, you know, four of those 10 kilograms away. And, you know, the person isn't having to, to work on lifting that. So, you know, taking about 40% of that induced strain off the back extensor muscles um, for these types of activities. So this is still kind of research that's ongoing, but we're very excited about that. And we also have tried very hard to think about how do we quantify you know, this and really kind of make the effect of the exosuit um, a little bit more real so that we can understand it. Um, and so any ideas that people have about doing this, you know, would love to kind of chat to people more as well. And then we also saw something pretty similar for stoops. So the device can help people either in a squat or in a stoop. 
and so we saw a similar trend of, of reductions across both of those two different types of activities. So I'm, I'm going to conclude here kind of like with, with this slide and kind of just talk a, a little bit again and say that, you know, I think what we're excited about and, and what our team is, is really focused on is developing these kind of active devices that are as simple as possible um, you know, um, and are able to kind of monitor what a person is doing. So they have wearable sensors that can kind of monitor kind of whether a person is lifting, how they're lifting, or if a person's working overhead, when they're working overhead, what task they're doing, and then be able to kind of dynamically adjust the assistance to kind of customize it to those specific tasks um, and also customize it to that specific individual. Because we're definitely learning that, you know, everybody kind of seems to kind of use these devices a little bit differently or needs you know, slightly adjusted or tailored assistance um, depending on you know, their body type, their abilities, um, and then the task that they're performing as well. So I think I'll, I'll end there um, and just really acknowledge that you know, all of this work that I've presented today is the work of a, a big team of people in the lab in particular. Um, you know, so we've had kind of both staff engineers, postdocs, graduate students kind of contribute to all these projects. Um, you know, our study volunteers, we've had a lot of people come in and volunteer um, in our study, so we really appreciate that. Um, and also we have kind of great faculty collaborators across, you know, mechanics, robotics, um, physical therapy, um, occupational therapy. And um, so, you know, it's, it's really kind of, we're lucky to have been able to work with such great collaborators on these projects too. And then, you know, wouldn't have happened without our, our funding sources as well. So I um, just want to acknowledge that as well. But my contact information is here. It's walsh at seas.harvard.edu. And then I've listed Ignacio, you know, is ignacio at vervmotion.com. So if you've got any specific questions related to Verve, you know, I think it's probably makes sense just to kind of reach out directly to Ignacio. And, but I'm certainly happy to kind of talk to people more about the, the research aspects um, as well. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop sharing screen and then I'm looking forward to, to kind of some discussion and questions with people. So this is Brent Baker. Connor, thank you very much for a very uh, informative, both uh, from the information you prov provided, but visually uh, informative uh, presentation. We do have a, a couple questions in the chat box, but I would also uh, remind people at this point that uh, you could unmute and ask a question. But um, so our first question in, in chat box, Connor, was from Marvin Chang. And he asked, how do you predict the motion in real time using the onboard sensors? And does that require a lot of computational power to estimate or identify the possible motions? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, we can do it pretty quickly. I, I don't have a specific number, um, but I think we can do it quick enough that it's not perceptible to the person. You know, I think we're doing it a little bit faster for the back exosuit. Um, and I, I think it takes a little bit longer um, to estimate kind of if a person is working overhead. Um, but because, you know, you know, we have to still inflate those actuators, it ends up really kind of not being too noticeable to the person in that delay. So I think in summary, I would say, I don't have a concrete number. I would say, you know, orders of milliseconds for, you know, the exosuit and then a little bit, you know, longer for the, um, uh, the shoulder device. And I, I would say the approaches we've used so far um, do not require a lot of computation. So we can do that pretty quickly with like a typical embedded system. Okay, so our next question is from Maricel Barbacel, Barbacel uh, from Toyota. And her question is for the active shoulder system, how quickly does the support activate then get out of the way? And are you at the speed that you feel you would need to be to imp for implementation in the study? And what is your target time? Yeah, that's a really great question and thanks. So I would say, you know, order, I think I might've put a number on one of the slides. I think order of like half a second and for having it kind of be able to inflate and deflate. So it's definitely not instant because, you know, you do have this inf system that you're inflating. So there's a time constant associated with that. Um, and then I think our goal is to be able to have, I think it's like maybe eight, um, you know, inflation cycles a, a, a minute, you know, so if a person is kind of lifting their arms and going up and down, you know, that's kind of like what we would be expecting to be able to, to do. Um, and then I think we would be, we're at the point now where, you know, we're, we're building a more refined prototype at the moment, and we would expect that prototype be something that, you know, we, we would love to, you know, have people evaluate, maybe not in a formal study right away, maybe we'd need to take a little bit more time, but be able to kind of like share those prototypes with people, you know, get some quick feedback and, and, and think about, you know, would there be kind of use cases that would be most suitable 
um, for those devices. Because you know, if you're moving your hands up and down every two seconds, um, maybe it's it's not the best application. But if there's kind of use cases where you're working, you know, overhead for kind of longer periods of time, like you know, 10, 15 seconds, um, and then lowering your hands and then going up again. Um, you know, I think it would work really well for, for those applications there. So very happy um, you know, to talk more about that offline. Okay, so our next question is from Evan Jones, and it is, where are you moving the load to from the back extensor muscles? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. And, and I know, you know, um, Carl Zellick, um, you know, has talked, you know, about this in some of his presentations as well. Um, you know, you're definitely kind of, you know, anchoring these devices to the shoulder and, and to the thighs, um, but you're taking advantage of kind of the large moment arm um, between kind of like where the device is applying forces and, and kind of the, the back uh, joints or the spine joints. And um, so you, you are transferring some of this force up to the shoulders and then down to the thighs. But I think it's done in a way that like really has minimal impact um, you know, on kind of the mechanics of those other joints um, you know, or really on kind of a person's kind of perception of, of wearing these devices. You definitely notice that there's forces being applied, um, but I, I don't think it's kind of, um, I wouldn't say so far there hasn't been a reaction that it's a negative. Okay. Next question I, is, I, I oh, I would, sorry, I would, I would also just say, I think it's the, it's the same challenge for any kind of device that's, you know, kind of not referenced to some kind of external reference frame such as the ground. And, you know, any of these devices, whether they're passive or active, that are just worn on the body, and, you know, ultimately the load, um, you know, is being distributed in a, in a slightly different way. But I think you can just do it in a smarter way than the, the body is currently doing it. Okay, so the next question is from Jack Liu. And it is, in your study, the peak normalized EMG activity of the back extensors uh, with active back assist suit is actually larger than that without the suit. Do you have any comments on this finding? The peak normalized EMG activity of back extensors with the active back of suit is actually larger than without the suit. Do you have any? So yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'll have to go back and kind of look at that a bit more. I don't have a quick answer for you, Jack, but I'm definitely happy to kind of talk um, offline. And this, you know, these results are pretty new. So, you know, we've been working on this more recently. And but so far we are seeing that, you know, comparing kind of lifting 10 kilograms and without the device versus lifting 10 kilograms, um, you know, with the device that we are seeing a kind of reduction in kind of the back extensor muscle activity. But I'm definitely happy to sync either now or, or kind of take it offline and, and try and chat a little bit more about that. So our next question comes from Rick Goggins, and the question is, do you have any plans to develop a head neck support for the overhead work? Yeah, I think that's a really um, interesting um, idea, and we're not working on it on it right now, but I, I think it's an exciting area, and I, I'm definitely seeing more and more people going after that, that use case. So the next question, and I apologize because I only have it, uh, the username is G, so from G, uh, are exoskeletons, exosuits being considered for use by other healthcare staff beyond physical therapists, example, nurses, nursing aides, et cetera, for the heavy lifting patient activities that they perform? So other people on the call might be better at answering that question than me. So I, I know, you know, people are discussing it and I know it's a, like a really important area. And we've taught a little bit about that ourselves and, and thought about, you know, could you apply the same types of principles of, you know, a device that helps a person when they need that help, but um, gets out of the way so that they don't feel like it's a burden to wear the rest of the time. And um, so I, I think that's kind of going to be one of the challenges because those people are, you know, they're not just lifting people all day. They're, they're probably doing that for the minority of their day. So really it's going to be important to have devices that, you know, allow them to do every other part of their job in addition to helping them, you know, with those more strenuous um, parts of the job. Okay, so the next question is from William Belotti. And his question is, how are your suits similar and or different than G-suits used for pilots and or, and or astronauts? That's a great question. I'm, I'm actually not too familiar with uh, G-suits myself. And um, so I don't know if I'm gonna give a great answer to that question. And, um, you know, I, I think with, with those devices, you know, they're they're really kind of probably doing much more than, than what we're doing in terms of being able to really kind of control kind of a person's blood pressure and, you know, as, as well. Um, I think maybe some of the similarities might be kind of the way that, 
you know, you have to anchor and apply pressure to the body and do that in a comfortable way. And so, you know, maybe we should look into those a little bit more and try and see if there's any lessons we could learn uh, for, from those applications. Okay, so our next question comes from Lying Zheng, and she says, it seems there are large loadings on the hand and arm, pulling, pushing, grasping, in addition to the large load in the back. Do you have any plans to put different assisted devices together to help different areas? Yeah, I, I think that sounds super exciting, and we would be very excited about that, and I know, like, in there's been a bunch of companies, you know, Sudex being one of them that has, you know, had these modular platforms where devices get used together. And I think that's a really elegant and, and nice approach. And I think with our systems for now, kind of we're using different technologies for, for both of these kind of two different projects. And so I think it might be hard to kind of have ours kind of come together. And, and I think one of the other challenges that you have with active systems when you want to have kind of multiple joints be assisted is, you know, you start to have kind of more battery requirements and increased actuator requirements, which I think kind of does create kind of like challenges in creating kind of truly modular um, systems that kind of stack on top of each other and for these different applications. And um, so I think probably, you know, I would I would say for a while, maybe it makes more sense to focus on more specific, um, you know, use cases where these devices are being used separately. But I think it's a really interesting research area to think about, you know, how would we have kind of modular systems and be able to kind of work together um, I, I, I think that's an exciting research topic and I think very valuable thing to work on. So as of right now, our last question is from Marcus Steinmetz and he asked, uh, what kind of safety aspects do you cover during validation of the product? Yeah, so, um, you know, we have surveys, you know, so we're, we're asking people for qualitative feedback as well. And, um, you know, and, you know, that's in our studies kind of at Harvard. And then I think, you know, um, Ignacio can maybe better speak to kind of the approach for kind of deploying with partners, kind of like, you know, for validation of the, the product once it's actually launched. And, but I, I think what we're trying to do in our general approach has been to kind of think about making sure that we're doing, you know, these kind of lab-based studies, you know, where we're really understanding the science of, you know, how do people interact with these devices? How do they adapt to, the, to these devices? What's the impact of these devices? You know, so in, in addition to seeing if the devices help certain muscles, we can see if they cause kind of strain, you know, in, in other muscles or increased activity in other muscles. We can look at um, if they kind of really change the way a person is moving and potentially cause them to move in a way that, you know, wouldn't be beneficial to a person or could create increased risk for a person. So I, I think for now, probably the things that we're doing most from a science perspective is, is seeing that it helps, but then making sure that it, it doesn't kind of hinder a person or increase risk for a person in, in any other way. And um, that's at least our approach in the lab, how, how we've been approaching that. Well, thank you, Connor. That was the last question as of right now. So if anybody else has any other questions, additional questions, feel free to um, unmute yourself or to uh, go ahead and put it in the chat box this last, uh, last go. Yeah, and thanks so much, Brent, for, for moderating the questions and, and thanks everyone for the, the um, the discussion it was super interesting it's it's always annoying not to be able to do it in person so I look forward to the day that we can actually have some discussions in, in person with people as well and in the meantime if people you know would like to just connect and chat more um, I'm happy to dig deeper into any aspect of this so feel free to just get in touch with me directly you know my email is walch at seas.harvard.edu um, or reach out to the NIOSH team and, and happy to kind of arrange something together but we're definitely um, we know it's hard developing these devices and also evaluating them so we're very excited and open to collaborations with, with anyone. Great, thank you, Connor. Okay, thank you everyone. I don't see any additional questions in our chat box. I wanna make sure to thank our presenter and thank everyone who joined us today.